This is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter, back for another month in review. This time, June 2018. Some modern birds make very unique noises, such as the booming sounds made by certain species of pheasant and grouse. In order to produce these sounds, these species needed highly developed and dedicated tracheas and vocal systems. And their exact evolution into this kind of system was for a while unknown. This past June though, scientists described a Miocene pheasant which had the preserved trachea and found it to be very coiled. So coiled in fact that if stretched out, it would be longer than the bird itself. This very long trachea would help the animal to produce these deeper, bassier notes than most birds by allowing more air to pass through the animal's body when producing calls. Following the mass extinction 66 million years ago, new niches opened up for mammals to fill after the dinosaurs died. Some of these niches were filled by groups that we actually don't have today, such as the embrithopods, which means heavy-footed. Some of them were quite notable in having two horns and again being very large and seemingly like rhinoceroses. A new jawbone shows just how far back these species date, coming from the millions of years just after the extinction, however being much smaller than a rhinoceros. So although we don't have these groups, the embrithopods today, their initial success after the extinction and then later failure helps us to understand how life might adapt as new extinctions happen in our own modern world. A paper last month looked at the oceanic collapse in the Permian-Triassic seas 252 million years ago. Specifically, they looked at how different atoms may have bonded due to the increased temperatures caused by the Siberian traps. Their findings showed that there was a greater amount of carbon to nitrogen bonding, which creates cyanide, a poison. This carbon to nitrogen bonding helped to cause an initial wave of extinctions during the late Permian period. However, as the Siberian traps were still erupting, there was an additional reaction that occurred, bonding carbon to nitrogen to sulfur, which creates thiocyanate, which acts very similar to cyanide. This secondary reaction helped to cause another wave of extinctions in the late Permian, helping to cause the extinctions of over 95% of life in the oceans. This study is important to look at for many people because we're already starting to see some of this carbon to nitrogen bonding in our own oceans today. That means we may already be well on our way to another mass extinction if we don't do something to combat climate change. So those of you from my home state of Arizona should probably know of the tarantula hawk, and I imagine many more of you also know of it. These wasps fly around, paralyze tarantulas, and then lay their eggs on it. These eggs then hatch and eat the paralyzed tarantula. There are dozens of these kinds of parasitoid wasps around the world. However, they've also been around for millions of years. Specifically, seven new species were named, coming from the Musil pit in Germany from 55 million years ago helping to just shed a little more light on how these species got so widespread. The open oceans are cold. It's not an ideal environment for most reptiles, and the sea reptiles we do have today are generally hanging around the equator and the warm tropical regions. However, plesiosaurs had a worldwide distribution, and some scientists think that that could be because they evolved to be warm-blooded. The scientists have a wide spectrum of reasons that they believe plesiosaurs to be warm-blooded, such as the growth rates in their bones being more in line with other warm-blooded animals, the oxygen isotopes in their teeth being indicative of warm-blooded animals, large canals that seem to have held vessels going into the bones, another thing indicative of warm-blooded animals, their widespread abundance in many different biomes, including some that would be rather cold, and finally, their seeming preference for case selection in raising young that is, having one young and raising it for a longer period of time. With this newer understanding, it can help us to understand and grasp just why we don't see the same kinds of large seagoing reptiles in our modern world today, as they haven't been able to develop the same amount of warm-blooded endothermy. Tuberculosis is a disease which has killed millions. However, diseases like it have been around for millions of years. Fossils of Pernusticosaurus a marine reptile from the Triassic period shows damage on the inside of the ribs that seems to be in line with what we know it happens 
with other breathing-related diseases, such as tuberculosis, meaning that diseases like tuberculosis are likely to be an impact in life for quite a long time after the modern day, and so we need to make sure that we are doing the proper research to control these diseases to make a better life for everyone. Frogs are generally very rare in the fossil record, as they're light-boned and relatively small, so end up very damaged or unidentifiable by the time that scientists are able to pull them out of the ground. Amber coming from trees, though, has the advantage of protecting the specimen a little bit more securely. This past month, scientists described four new different specimens of ancient tree frogs from the Burmese forests 99 million years ago, helping us to expand our very limited knowledge on just how frogs were able to expand and come to populate so many of the world's ecosystems. In vertebrates, the hyoid bone in the throat is able to help control the tongue and dictates just what exactly it can do. For example, according to a study published this month, Tyrannosaurus rex couldn't actually stick out its tongue, despite what Jurassic Park The Lost World may show us. And this was the main thing that many of the news outlets grasped onto. However, what they didn't grasp onto from the same study is that many birds are able to stick out their tongues, for example, woodpeckers, and that a study of the pterosaurs, closely related to the dinosaurs, could also stick out their tongues, helping to show some of the different amounts of convergent evolution that occurs in the different species, despite how distantly or similarly they might be related. One paper announced a new synapsid predator from the Permian of Russia. The species, Gorynychus massutinae, was a thyrosothelian, closely related to the species that would come to dominate the later Permian, the Gorgonopsids. This comes with a paper by the same authors explaining and describing two previously known Gorgonopsids in greater detail. These Gorgonopsids were very early ones and come to be found as a very basal member and a slight sister species to what would evolve into the mainline Gorgonopsids that would come to dominate the end of the Permian. Through this analysis of the thyrocephalians and Gorgonopsids, we're finding a similar parallel to what we find in South Africa during the same period. After the mid-Permian extinction, which killed off large predators such as Dimetrodon, they were fairly quickly replaced by predators such as the Therocephalians, and then later the Gorgonopsids, who dominated the planet until their end at the end of the Permian, 252 million years ago. Ceratosaurus is one of the most recognizable species of the late Jurassic, and its relative Carnotaurus is one of the most recognizable from the Cretaceous of South America. However, their exact relationships, other than being generally related, was not entirely understood. And so for this piece, we're going to be delving a little deeper into how different species are separated. Specifically, we're going to be looking at the Ceratosaurs, which are species like Ceratosaurus and its relative Genedectes, the Abelosaurs, which are species like Abelosaurus all the way through the evolutionary line to things like Carnotaurus, the Noosaurus, which is species like Noosaurus and Deltadromeus, and then the Ceratosauroids, which encompasses all three of those branches, including the Ceratosaurs. So when I mention those, they are different. The scientists look at different bone morphology, particularly in some of the legs and the skulls, to help establish a link between the Ceratosaurs and the Abelosaurs, allowing us to group them into a singular group separate from the Noosaurs. This new group is a Tringosauria, and contains both the Abelosaurs, such as Carnotaurus, and the Ceratosaurs, such as Ceratosaurus. This helps us to separate out the Noosaurs, as they were very evolutionary different as far as the paths they took than the rest of the group under the Ceratosauroids. This helps us understand how singular groups, such as the Ceratosauroids, were able to diversify so greatly. For example, Masiakosaurus was one of the Noosaurs, that had very large and notable protruding teeth, seemingly to catch fish or other small prey. Meanwhile, things like the Ceratosaurus developed very large, long teeth in order to try and cut into their prey, and things like Carnotaurus developed very short, squat heads. By understanding these evolutionary connections, we're able to better understand how life might be affected now and how it might influence evolution in the near future. Large parts of the southern U.S. have been notable for a lack of Cretaceous finds, and while there have been a few, such as Acrocanthosaurus fossils in Texas, or even things like Sonorosaurus in Arizona, 
Mexico has had a distinct lack of many fossil finds. However, that changed with the discovery of a new notosaur, Acanthalipin gonzalezi. This new species helps to enlighten us on exactly what species evolved in Mexico, as right now there's very limited finds coming from there. Hopefully this find will inspire more people to be able to get out and look for fossils in Mexico and help us to get a better picture of what was happening in the Cretaceous of Mexico and Southern Laramidia. Many people know of the Cambrian explosion when all of life suddenly just erupted onto the scene. However, scientists have now found many more species that are dating even older than that to things like the Etikarian period. Specifically, scientists in China this past month announced and described a set of fossilized footprints from the Etikarian period, the oldest footprints ever found. These footprints are notable in that they show a symmetry and a singular symmetry across a single plane, rather than something like a sea urchin or sea star, which shows a five-way symmetry. This recognition of the footprints as being just a single symmetry helps us to understand the evolution of nearly all life that we see today. Everything outside of things like crinoids and the sea urchins, which I mentioned earlier, things that aren't just singularly laterally, would likely be able to trace their origins back to this species or a species like it, helping us understand how evolution has changed the planet for the last 500 plus million years. Still in the Eticarian period, but this time Australia's Eticarian period, two new species were named after former US President Barack Obama and the naturalist David Attenborough. Obamus coronatus and Attenborites genae were two very small species which lived on the seafloor and basically just kind of lived around as sponges as they were very early species and didn't have much going on there to avoid, such as predators. Hi everyone, thank you for watching. Appreciate the support the channel's got, and sorry that I've been slower on videos. I'm gonna make sure I, at the least, do these every month. I will have a video for uh, Jurassic World talking about some of the science in that, or sometimes the lack thereof. Thanks everyone, have a good day, take care, Gecko Extinct.